Breaking news, there is a gigantic coronal hole that's currently on the Earth-facing side of the sun right now, and the high-speed stream that it's emitting out into the solar wind is set to sweep by planet Earth in less than 24 hours. NOAA is forecasting that this will trigger a G1 to G2 geomagnetic storm. The scale rating goes from 1 to 5, 5 being the most severe. And so this is expected to increase geomagnetic volatility across the planet, cause there to be more aurora, and there are connections between coronal hole high-speed streams and various geophysical events across the planet. For example, they are connected to earthquakes. They're also connected to changes in tropospheric weather like cyclones and tornadoes. And so we have the biggest coronal hole that we have seen in probably about 10 years or more. And what's so shocking about this to NASA is the fact that it's occurring during solar maximum when typically you don't see coronal holes this large. We usually see coronal holes like this size or maybe a little bit larger. The big coronal holes typically show up during solar minimum when the sun's activity is low. But right now we are in solar maximum. The magnetic field of the sun is mid-flip. It's very chaotic. You have a lot more energy coming out of the sun. So to have this sort of dynamic at play is quite anomalous. And we really don't know how this high-speed stream impact is going to go. Again, that forecast from NOAA's for G1 to G2 but we have seen coronal hole high-speed stream impacts before, especially around equinox season, which we are in right now, that can trigger severe geomagnetic storms. So that is a possibility depending on the intrinsic magnetic field dynamics of this coronal hole. So we're gonna explore all that and more in today's video. Hey everyone, and welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, I'm your space weatherman, Stefan Burns. On this channel, we discuss what is happening energetically here on Earth. We look at the geology, we look at the geophysics, but we also turn our attention to the sun and solar activity, space weather, what's happening in the solar system, planetary resonances, even cosmic forces, how all that combined together affects us here on Earth. If you like the sound of that, then please subscribe. Now let us start with this diagram that I created, which shows in general what is occurring with this coronal hole high-speed stream as it relates to Earth. Now keep in mind that Earth is one astronomical unit away from the Sun, and so it's quite close to the Sun, whereas the largest gas giant, Jupiter, is five astronomical units away on average. Saturn, 10 astronomical units away. Then you go to Uranus, 20 AU. Neptune, 30 AU. So at one AU, we are quite close to the Sun, and we get some pretty strong space weather impacts as a result. So here we have our sun and we have this coronal hole there. This is just an illustration. Uh, and we see that we have this high speed stream flowing out of it. It is a low density and a high velocity. These are plasma ions that are flowing out of the sun because the magnetic field is open and charge carriers, ions, they flow along magnetic fields. And so this ma open magnetic field configuration causes these ions to flow out very quickly the velocity of a high-speed stream is typically about 450 to 800 kilometers per second, which is, in general, faster than the ambient solar wind velocity. And what happens is because it is a higher velocity than the ambient solar wind, it will then kind of catch up to the slowest plasma structure and it'll form a high-density plasma wall or a sear, a co-rotating interaction region. So you get this pile up of plasma that keeps building up and the density goes up, up, up. The velocity doesn't change. And then behind that, you have the high-speed stream. So here we have Earth in its orbit, one AU away. And this co-rotating interaction region is set to sweep by Earth around March 25th or so. As I'm filming this, it's March 24th about 24 to 36 hours, anytime in that zone or less. And then after that high density plasma sweeps by the earth and causes an initial spike in geomagnetic volatility, then you get the high speed stream and the plasma velocity will go up. And typically the onset of a geomagnetic storm from a coronal hole high speed stream is quite gradual. When you have a coronal mass ejection, a blob of plasma that shoots out from the sun that hits Earth. Typically, it's a really rapid spike in the impact and the geomagnetic volatility, but coronal hole high-speed streams can be these more gradual, longer duration increases in geomagnetic activity. It can take hours to really get going, and depending on the magnetic field characteristics of this, this can send our geomagnetic volatility up quite a bit. 
So they have a forecast for a G1 to G2 storm, but we've seen in the past G3 and even G4 storms before from coronal hole high speed streams. And this one that we are seeing right now is the biggest that we have seen in a long, long time. Let's check out the historic record. We're gonna look at three different very large coronal holes that have occurred in recent history in the 21st century. And by no means is this a definitive account of the largest coronal holes during this time frame. But these ones definitely stand out and give you a sense of the scale that these coronal holes have at their maximum. This is July 16th, 2013. We see it's mostly there in the Northern Hemisphere. It's most, mostly concentrated right here, though it does extend out there. And a coronal hole in general is an area where the plasma temperature is lower and the magnetic field is open. So this is still very, very bright, but it is dimmer than the rest of the sun. And so it shows up as a dark splotch on the sun in comparison to the bright regions, but you can't really see these all that easily with your own naked eyes. You need special instrumentation to see these coronal holes. But we see this one here from July 16th, 2013. This was also around solar maximum, and it is also a little anomalous because it is concentrated here in the northern hemisphere near the poles of the sun when you have the magnetic field mid flip, but solar cycle 24, the last solar cycle was a bit anomalous in general because it was a weaker solar cycle. So this isn't especially atypical, you could say as a result of the dynamics of that, but this goes to show you how large coronal holes can get as well. And I'd say that the coronal hole that we have right now is probably bigger than this one, but we have some more recent coronal holes that were also very large closer in time to right now. Let's check them out. And here we have an example of another very large coronal hole that appeared on the sun just recently. This is about nine years ago now. This is September 1st to 2nd of 2016. So now we are in the descending phase going towards solar minimum of solar cycle 24, which had its maximum from in general around 2012 to 2014. And the minimum period was around 2019 to 2020. So we see that this is also a very large coronal hole, again, concentrated here in the Northern Hemisphere in the high latitude regions, but also stretching across the solar equator, very much like the one that we're having right now. And the fact that it is down here and stretching all the way up to the Northern Hemisphere. So this is another very large coronal hole that we had about nine years ago and about similar in scale. Now, if we go forward in time three months to January 2017, we find another very large coronal hole on the sun, again during the descending phase of solar cycle 24, but this time the coronal hole is stretching all the way from the southern hemisphere near the pole, all the way through the equator. And you see this other coronal hole there as well. So again, you also have that one up there. You have this little bit, almost like a coronal hole appendage to this one, but this is another very large coronal hole. But again, the one that we have right now is even larger, but what is a coronal hole? Let's learn a little bit more about what they actually are. We've been looking at the sun in a variety of colors, mainly this purple view of the sun, and these colors correspond to different wavelengths of light measured in angstroms. And they color them so, just so it's easy to differentiate one from the other. And so by looking at the sun at different wavelengths of light, we're able to image different structures of the sun. You have the outermost layer of the sun. This is the corona. This is the hottest part of the sun, reaching millions of degrees Kelvin, or also millions of degrees centigrade. And this is the part of the sun that is completely ionized. It's a plasma. It's the lowest density part of the sun, and it bleeds out into the solar wind. That is the corona. We've been looking at coronal holes. We'll get back to that. Now we also have the chromosphere and then we have the photosphere. So you get deeper and deeper towards the surface of the sun and the temperature goes down. The corona is the hottest and then you have the chromosphere and then the photosphere is maybe about 4,000 Kelvin and it actually will go down even more within a sunspot in particular. So you have the photosphere here, then you have the 304 angstrom view showing the chromosphere. We'll look at that in a little bit just for right now. And then you have this 193 angstrom view of the sun which shows the corona. And then we have our 211 angstrom view of the sun which shows the most highly energetic plasma surrounding the sun. That's why these coronal holes show up so nicely in the 211 angstrom view because it is a part of the corona that is a lower temperature. The magnetic field is open it kind of pulls all the plasma in and causes it to then get accelerated along these magnetic field lines. 
and that outflow of energy causes the temperature to go down. So it shows up really nicely on the 211 angstrom view of the sun. Let us look now at our 304 angstrom view of the sun for right now to see what this coronal hole looks like. And here we have the same video for the present moment going from March 20th to 24th, 2025. And you don't really see the coronal hole all that easily. We are looking at the chromosphere of the sun. This is about 50,000 degrees Kelvin. This is underneath the corona. So we do see a little bit of darkening there. You can see the outline of this coronal hole, but it is not as obvious. It does not show up as nicely as it does in these different wavelengths of light that show the solar corona. But what is interesting about coronal holes is that their origin actually lies deep within the sun because they are connected to the magnetic field, right? The magnetic field is in this open configuration. And so it's because of how the magnetic field within the dynamo of the sun is changing that you can have coronal holes to develop. And so as a result, we do see them slightly in these deeper layers, like the chromosphere here, which is again, 50,000 Kelvin, but it does not show up as nicely as it does in these other angstrom views, which show higher Kelvin temperatures of the sun. And here we're looking at a still image for the sun today so we can understand these magnetic field dynamics. And so we see these active regions which are bright, and you'll notice that these magnetic field lines, they loop out and then they connect back in. There is this effectively like a closed circuit with that magnetic field. But you'll notice with this coronal hole, these dark regions, you see the field lines basically just flowing out directly into the solar wind. And so that is the dynamic that's at play. You just, for some reason, have the magnetic field deeper within the sun, just remaining in this more open configuration, not looping back in on itself like you see with these active regions or with sunspots. And that just in general supercharges the solar wind. And something else that's really interesting about this gargantuan coronal hole that's currently about to hit Earth with its high speed stream is the fact that it has survived six solar rotations now. It has appeared on the sun six different times before. We can see its evolution across time with this video compilation that I made. Here it is the first time. It was just a little baby. And then we see it getting bigger and then larger and we see it progressively growing. It eventually meets up with this coronal hole. And now on the seventh time, this is completely linked in even with this region down there and that entire zone filled in as well. And so these coronal holes can be pretty long lived structures. And that is important as it relates to the geophysics of Earth because of their magnetic field characteristics. They have certain dynamics that they imbue the solar wind with, right? They create that region of higher plasma density, which is then followed by that higher velocity plasma that interacts with Earth's magnetic field in some interesting ways. And because there's a regular loading of that every 28 days, if it survives successive rotations, you get this regular pulse of energy into the Earth geophysical system. And so there is quite a lot of research connecting coronal holes to a variety of geophysical processes here on Earth. For example, there is a connection between coronal hole high speed streams and giant earthquakes. These are the largest earthquakes, magnitude eight and greater. There's also a connection between coronal holes and enhanced tropospheric weather, for example, cyclones and tornadoes. I'll link two research papers for you to read up more on about that but this is something worth paying attention to, especially when the coronal hole keeps getting larger and larger and larger. Throughout this video, I've been using the word plasma and some of you may be wondering, what the heck is plasma? Well, there are four states of matter. We have the three that we are familiar with. There are solids, liquids, and gases, and then there's plasma, the fourth state. And so solids are the least energized. They have these strong crystalline bonds that hold molecules together. And then you have liquids where those bonds may not be as strong and there's still cohesive forces that keep them close together, but they're able to move past each other. Think of liquid water. Then you have gases. Now those cohesive forces diminish and these molecules can actually fling off from one another. And in general, they are able to resist the force of gravity more because they are more energized. And so as you go up from the, so the surface of the earth, you go from solids to liquids to gases. Well, if you go even beyond that, you get plasma, which is the most energized. 
these molecules can actually start to break apart and you can have electrons exist on their own, unbound to anything. You have protons exist on their own, unbound to anything. Now you have negative charge carriers, positive charge carriers, and they can now interact with electric and magnetic fields in interesting and unique ways. 99% of the universe is plasma. So it is solids, liquids, and gases are in fact quite bizarre if you look at this from a universe perspective. And the sun is always emitting a ton of plasma out into space with the solar wind, which then interacts with our planet via the magnetic field. And then that gets deposited into our magnetosphere, into the plasmasphere, the radiation belt, which exists outside beyond the ionosphere. So you have the solid earth, which is solid. Then you have like, let's say the oceans and bodies of water, which are water. Then you have the atmosphere. But once you go about 50 to 100 kilometers up, you start to encounter plasma in the ionosphere, which is made up of about 1% plasma. As you move through the ionosphere, the density keeps getting lower and lower. And then eventually around 1000 kilometers out from the surface, you encounter the radiation belts and that's then when you enter predominantly into this world of plasma. So the sun right now is launching a bunch of plasma our way. First, it's going to sweep by the earth with this higher density CIR, co-rotating interaction region, that's created from that pile up of plasma. And then the high velocity, high speed stream is going to follow up right behind. And plasma is super interesting because though it is super energized, it is still able to retain these organized, and coherent dynamics. So it has these properties of self-organization. It can form things like Coulomb crystals. And so there's a lot of integrity and structure actually within plasma that's quite surprising. There's a lot more that we don't know about plasma than we do know about plasma, but we know that the sun is directly interacting with Earth at every single moment in time because of its outflow of solar wind. In fact, that this extends to all the planets in the solar system because all of them are being continuously bathed within the plasma of the solar wind and the solar wind then creates this interplanetary magnetic field which connects all the plants together simultaneously. And something else that we can expect from this space weather impact from this coronal hole is aurora. When you have something like a high speed stream interact with Earth's magnetic field and plasmasphere, you get ions that stream down from the plasmasphere into Earth's atmosphere. These charge the different gases of the atmosphere and create these wonderful lights in the sky that we call aurora. You have aurora borealis in the northern hemisphere and you have aurora australis in the southern hemisphere. And aurora actually show you the magnetic field lines of the earth. They travel along these magnetic field lines. And you can have things like geomagnetic pulsations, these regular rhythms of vibration in Earth's magnetic field that actually show themselves when they're energized with these charged particles and the glowing lights of the aurora. So these high speed stream impacts are famous for creating wonderful aurora conditions because of the fact that they do have this gradual onset and long duration, coronal holes can really trigger these longer duration light shows. And that's what we have coming up in about 24 to 36 hours. And so make sure you subscribe to the channel to stay up to date with what is happening here on Earth energetically. I will keep you up to date. And in general, you can keep an eye on the Space Weather Prediction Center website that is created and hosted by NOAA. I'll put a link in there for you for the real-time Aurora forecast. If you're in these high latitude regions, if you live in Canada or Northern Europe, or you're the southern coast of Australia or Tasmania or South America, New Zealand, and perhaps even into the mid-latitude zones, if you're in the upper part of the United States, for example, or for example, like Northern Germany, those sort of places, you may be seeing Aurora in just a day or two. So please subscribe to the channel. I'll keep you up to date. Again, I've been your host, Stefan Burns. Thank you all so much for watching. Wishing you all well. I'll see you all in the next video.